Okay. Hello, folks. Welcome, everybody, to uh, our public hearing and clause-by-clause -clause review of the uh, Bill 7, an act to amend the Revolving Funds Act, hosted by the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment. So we do have an agenda before us, and uh, we'll start with a prayer, and I'll ask MLA O'Reilly to lead us in prayer. Thank you. Uh, we are grateful for our Northwest Territories, for our homes, for our neighbours and for our freedom. We are grateful for the opportunity we have to meet here and to serve our fellow citizens. May we bring both the strength of our convictions and the willingness to listen and learn to our discussions. May we consider the needs and aspirations of all our fellow citizens in our decisions. And may we always represent our constituents with dignity, integrity and honesty. Thank you. Thank you. As I said, welcome to this meeting of the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment. To kick things off, I'll go around and ask MLAs to introduce themselves for the record. And I'll start over here. Good evening. Kieran Tester, a member for Cam Lake. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Danny McNeely, Satu Region. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. My name's Corey Vanthine, and I'm the MLA for Yellowknife North. <laughs> And we also have with us here this evening, to my left, Alicia Tumshwitz from our research department, and to my right, Mr. Michael Ball from the clerk's office. And so, um, today the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment is holding a public review of Bill 7, an act to amend the Revolving Funds Act, which establishes a revolving fund at the Yellowknife Airport. The bill itself, which is available at the back of the room, along with the briefing notes, is quite short. However, the legislation enables changes in the operations of the Yellowknife Airport and provides that all revenues generated at the airport would be used to cover the cost of operations, maintenance, and capital upgrades, independent of government of the Northwest Territories subsidies. I will now invite the Honorable Wally Schumann, Minister of Transportation, to open the proceedings on Bill 7. Following the Minister's remarks, committee members may make comments or pose questions on the bill. Minister Schumann, please introduce your staff for the record and proceed with any opening remarks you may have on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for inviting us here today to review and discuss the details of Bill 7, an act to amend the Revolving Funds Act. I would like to welcome the members of the public here today as well as, and I would like to uh, thank them for their in this important initiative. With me today is uh, Russell Newdorf, Deputy Minister of Transportation, Michael Conway, Regional Superintendent of the North Slave, Sonia Saunders, Director of Planning, Policy and Communications, Dila Chesworth, Director of Airports, Lee Stroman, Regional Airport Manager at the Elnife Airport, Neil Rayner, Managing Director of Lindbergh Group, Sandy Kluktar, Deputy Minister to the Financial Management Board, Ken Kutsoff, Legislative Council of the Department of Justice and my special advisor, Ryan Strain. Mr. Chair, the proposed bill would introduce the new revolving fund for the Yellowknife Airport with an authorized limit of $36 million for the purpose of funding the ongoing capital and operations and maintenance expenditures of the airport. Mr. Chair, the Yellowknife Airport is a critical gateway to the Northwest Territories. Establishing a streamlined funding structure would allow the airport to become a financially self-sufficient. With the establishment of this fund, all revenues generated by the Yellowknife Airport will be retained by the Yellowknife Airport for operations and capital investments. This will mean the airport operates more like a business, funding its operations and capital improvements through the money it collects itself and not depending on the government for subsidies. Currently, revenue from the Yellowknife Airport is paid directly to the Government of the Northwest Territories Consolidated Revenue Fund. Operating expenditures for the airport are paid for from the Department of Transportation's annual appropriation and capital expenditures are approved through the capital budget planning process. As such, the airport competes with hospitals, schools and all other GNWT programs for the funding. This model does not allow for sufficient financial resources to support effective long-term infrastructure investment, economic development and business at the airport. It is also a serious drain on NWT's fiscal resources. There are a number of benefits occurring from the establishment of a revolving fund for the Yellowknife Airport. 
It could eliminate the need for subsidies from the GNWT, which currently amount to over $4 million annually. This would help to meet the fiscal challenges for the Government of the Northwest Territories. This new approach will result in better services for travelers, more opportunities for business, a source of funding dedicated to the airport means the airport will be able to invest in things more like parking, more retail space, expanded holding areas with better services after security, improvements to the terminal building and other changes to improve traveler experiences and help attract new businesses. This new approach will stimulate and help diversify the economy, allowing the airport to act as an economic catalyst and create jobs and opportunities for northerners. It would also allow tourists visiting Yellowknife or connecting to other destinations in the Northwest Territories to take away a better first impression of the North. These are upgrades that key stakeholders have said and they want to see at the airport. Improvements will allow air carriers who rely on our infrastructure to operate safely and efficiently to enhance the services they provide to the traveling public. Some of the improvements that would enhance airline services include increased resources to maintain runways, upgrade lighting to assist aircraft operation, a central de-icing facility to reduce travel delays. These are just some of the possibilities that become attainable with an airport that is more focused on service improvements and which has the increased ability to invest in needed capital improvements. Mr. Chair, a revolving fund for the Yellowknife Airport would collect both aeronautical revenues, such as aircraft landing fees, and non-aeronautic revenues, such as lease payments and vehicle parking. As well, a proposed airport improvement fee would contribute to the fund. This fee would apply to all outgoing flights from the Yellowknife Airport, amounting to $20 per passenger traveling outside the NWT and $10 per passenger traveling within the territory. This change would not apply to people changing planes as they travel to our NWT communities. Funds generated by the airport improvement fee will be used exclusively for capital improvements to the Yellowknife Airport. The, per the proposed induction of this airport improvement fee would not affect the cost of tour packages already sold for the following summer and winter tour seasons. Instead, the proposed fee would apply to travel booked, travel booked after the new fee is implemented. Fees will only be paid by people choosing to travel by air from Yellowknife instead of all by NWT residents who are currently helping to support the Yellowknife Airport through their taxes. Airports in southern Canada have been following this funding model for almost two decades. The Yellowknife Airport has the traffic volumes to successfully generate revenue to meet its financial requirements, fiscal requirements, sorry. Mr. Chair, as you know, we have consulted widely on these changes we have addressed 25 significant stakeholder groups. We have spoken to some 250 individuals in the process, and we have also received significant constructive feedback from the general public, which will be reflected in an updated business plan. Mr. Chair, Bill 7 would provide the next steps in working together with air carriers, tourism, businesses, and the public to advance the evolution of the Yellowknife Airport. Together, we can build a stronger Yellowknife Airport and a stronger NWT. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. And before I lead in with uh, committee and getting started on questions, I just want to get a sense tonight of who might be um, here this evening that's going to present verbally. And so if you could maybe just show your hand hold up and then I'm going to have um, our clerk, Mr. Ball, come around and get names from each of you so that we can get a, a, a list going, okay? So just please hold your hands up and, uh, and we'll go from there. And in the meantime, I'll get started with uh, committee comments, questions, concerns from committee. For the minister and staff. Anything? Mr. Tester. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, would, I don't want to speak as much to the bill as to what it enables, which is, as the Minister pointed out in his comments, the, uh, the overall improvement scheme for the airport. Um, so why has the Department, and, and I know that there's been a number of consultations, but if the Minister can just be clear about this, um, this has been sold kind of from day one as a governance improvement or essential improvements to the governance model when in fact most of the initial changes are going to be an improvement to 
the accounting structure and how the funds are provided to the airport and how the airport makes use of those funds. Um, the governance model essentially remains unchanged, uh, still being run by the Department of Transportation and uh, uh, with, with some input from the public. Is there an opportunity for this to evolve into something more like an independent airport authority? And is that the plan for the airport going forward? Thank you. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when we looked at this uh, back a ways and came up with different models how we could do this, uh, you could go to an airport authority right off the bat if you wanted, and there's different steps. But we've taken the approach where this is the first step of, of changing the governance model around how the airport is operated and how, how it's funding itself internally through the fees that we're going to introduce. And uh, our approach is, is a cautious one to take this first step and see how this works out. And uh, this type of approach with a revolving fund, we still have control on how the airport is operated. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I do appreciate that we want to get this right. Um, from a lot of the submissions and, and conversations with the public, I think m most people are very excited about the opportunity to develop crucial infrastructure for the airport, runways, de-icing facilities, tourism improvements, um, and they see this model as an opportunity to achieve that. And um, I think that that's a good thing, and, um, and this model will allow that. Um, we have seen some concerns about uh, the fees being passed on to customers and uh, a, pot a potential decline in uh, travel as a, as a result. Um, what, what does the minister have to say to, uh, to that potential a downturn in, in the amount of visitors or people using air, uh, people traveling to the Northwest Territories as a result of higher fees? Uh, or sorry, higher fares that are being passed on to consumers by fees. Thank you. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As I said in my opening comments, uh, airport fees have been in place for a couple decades already in most airports, and, and all of us that do travel, it's, it's just part of traveling. Uh, we do not believe that these fees will be cause any disruption into the tourism business or commercial travel in any way. In many ways, we believe that this will enhance the amount of people that will be able to come to the Yellowknife Airport and the Northwest Territories through possibilities of direct flights from different locations around the world, be it Vancouver or internationally, depending on how all that rolls out. Um, the biggest thing about this whole thing is be able to reinvest in the airport. It's already an economic driver in, in the city of Yellowknife, and we believe with the reinvestment of this, these dollars that, that, that are to come flow through these fees and improvement fees and landing fees and such, will create a better economic driver and create more economic opportunity for the city of Yellowknife and the Northwest Territories. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart? Um, on the, thank you to, uh, to the minister for that. Um, on the uh, uh, matter of the Economic Advisory Council, um, I believe the proposal currently is to find uh, seven um, business professionals with entre entrepreneurial skills. Other um, airport models have, um, uh, municipalities, uh, counties, uh, the federal government um, appointing representatives as well to these kind of bodies. Now, I know this one is specifically economic, but uh, given that there are key uh, stakeholders in the city of Yellowknife who might uh, um, uh, benefit from sitting on such an advisory panel, is the department opening to, open to uh, reviewing that board or the, the panel? And... Um, making some uh, some changes from what's being initially proposed to include those stakeholders and also to um, to make the terms of reference very clear to this commu committee and to members of the public uh, so we know exactly what this uh, what the powers of this panel are going to be and how much they can influence the growth and development of the airport as an economic driver thank you mr chair thank you minister schumann thank you mr chair um, I think that what the member's talking about there is more of an airport authority model where they have uh, municipalities and people like that such on the boards. Uh, this is a revolving fund. We want to go out to an advisory group of people. Uh, we're working on, uh, on how that's all going to roll out, and we want to involve uh, uh, business people, stakeholders who are going to help drive the economy around the airport for the city of Yellowknife and uh, 
when we get those details worked out, we'll definitely share them with committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Nothing further. Next, I have Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I guess I'd like to start with um, what sort of, uh, what's the operating costs or subsidies for other airports in the Northwest Territories uh, through the Department of Transportation other than Yellowknife? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Newdorf. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I'm recalling the numbers correctly, and I, I'll round a little bit, but our total budget on the airport side is about $15 million uh, to operate airports. And uh, so Yellowknife Airport would take about $5 million of that, so the other airports would take the $10 million. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. So if the uh, Yellowknife Airport's a draw on the GNWT budget, and I think the minister's remarks here talk about $4 million. Um, are we looking at going to a similar sort of model for the other airports here in the Northwest Territories, uh, or we're going to continue to subsidize those airports as well? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The shorter answer is no. The other airports in the GNWT don't have the, the no amount of traffic to... Uh, to have that type of business model around it. So we will continue to operate them as we do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thank you, and thanks for the response. Um, I guess one of the issues um, that I've uh, heard about is uh, the need for some sort of uh, measurement of indicators, reporting, benchmarks, and so on around um, what actual improvements are going to be made at the airport and how are they going to improve things like uh, lineup times, waiting times, uh, the amount of time it takes for people to get their bags, uh, um, you know, flight arrivals, departures. Do we actually, have you developed a, a benchmarking system and uh, some sort of public reporting so that um, people have some confidence that the money that's being spent on improvements is actually helping improve services that are available to the public. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, those are good questions. Uh, moving forward, that would, be, that would be part of our business planning process, and that's where this advisory board would have some input into the, what they would see as a priority as, as capital and O&M expenditures for operating at the airport, and that would be produced annually at the business plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm glad to hear uh, that the uh, Airport Economic Advisory Committee is going to have a, some role in that. But let's go back to the committee for a second. Um, uh, my colleague had asked earlier about uh, a terms of reference for this body. Um, it's not clear to me in reading the business plan and uh, some of the other uh, information that we've received what the real roles and responsibilities uh, and accountability of that committee are going to be. And um, the reason why I ask that is uh, great that we might have uh, seven business leaders with proven strategic entrepreneurial success uh, appointed, but how are those people going to be selected? Are they going to be, is there going to be a public uh, invitation to apply? Uh, are they going to be representative in some way? Um, and what's the accountability of this uh, uh, group? And you know, will they keep uh, uh, business meeting summaries? Uh, are they going to be remunerated? With, will their remuneration come out of uh, the the, uh, uh, the revolving fund itself? Uh, is there going to be a website, some sort of public reporting? Those are all key questions that we just don't have any details on. And I think if people want to see money, or if people have money being uh, spent on airport improvement fees, they want to have some confidence that it's not just Department of Transportation deciding on, on how the airport's going to be run, that there's going to be a, a, a group of folks that might be representative and so on that have some say in that. So, sorry, I've gone on for a bit there, there but uh, I just don't have any sense of what the roles and responsibility of this group is and whether they're going to be representative in some way and what the accountability really is. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that's a fair question. Uh, we're developing the draft in terms of reference on how we want to do this. Um, we believe uh, 
to answer some of your questions, to, to they would be an advisory body advising on how the, how the airport would be uh, spending their expenditures on capital and O&M moving forward, and what other types of advice that uh, that would come probably I guess at the end of the day to the minister, at whoever at uh, transportation. Um, as far as uh, who's going to be sitting on this board and stuff, we're still trying to develop all that. If we're going to go out for a call, call for interest. But as, as the minister, I would like to see people that are on this board that have a vested interest in how the airport operates and is maintained, and some people with some economic sense on how we're going to make it into a significant driver for the economy in Yellowknife and the Northwest Territories. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, any idea when this uh, draft terms of reference might be available and whether that can be shared with the committee uh, in the next couple of weeks or something? Uh, what, is that possible? Thank you. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we can probably do that in early, early in the new year. Uh, we want to see where this process goes from year to day. Uh, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves on that, but uh, like I say, it's in a draft form right now, and we could probably share that with committee early in the new year. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Sure. Uh, one more, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, um, I guess I'm going to suggest that um, Department of Transportation look at the... Uh, um, there's a uh, Waste Reduction and Recovery Act uh, Advisory Committee that I chaired at one point, and... Uh, <laughs> you know well about it from your previous portfolio. It's actually established in legislation, um, but it is a representative group. They help design uh, the uh, recycling programs that we have in place. Uh, they give advice to the minister, the department. They look at budgets uh, uh, and help design programs and so on, and it's, uh, it's representative. I think it's a, a good model that you might uh, consider, and there is a terms of reference. The people that sit on it are remunerated, um, and they, there is a record of meetings and so on kept. I think that's a good model, and I would suggest that you, you might uh, consider looking at that uh, in developing this. But I, I think this is a really crucial item for, for me, and I think some members of the public that I've heard, um, that uh, it will be good to try to have a sense of where this is going sooner than later. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Uh, I'll take the comments back and we'll have a look at it. It's, uh, it's probably worth exploring to have a look at how that was set up. As uh, the member has stated, I used to be the Minister of ENR, so I have a little bit of idea how that that's program is set up, but we can compare that to what we have in draft form, so I'll take his comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anything further? Mr. O'Reilly. Next I have Mr. Testart and then Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, uh, I, I understand the rationale behind the um, uh, airport improvement fee, and that's uh, been the subject of most of the, the public discussion, but there's also the issue of the aeronautical revenues, and many of those fees haven't been changed for a very long time and are um, some of the lowest in the country, perhaps the lowest in the country. Um, and now the, the proposal is to increase them by, in some cases, double and not to phase them in over time. Um, why was that decision? Why, why did the, the, the minister um, uh, or department decide to do such a sharp increase, 100% in some cases uh, or higher? And can we get some uh, understanding of that? Thank you. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one of the reasons we didn't want to phase in uh, the, the fees, as the members alluded to, is that that wouldn't make the business model uh, financially sustainable right off the bat. So it's just prolonging the pain in the in way I look at it. So if we're going to do this, we're all in, and uh, let's get on with business and, and make the airport an economic driver for the city. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the answer from the minister. Um, in the discussions the department has had with air carriers, are those increased aeronautical fees? Will those be passed on to the consumer? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, they will be. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so in total, do, does uh, 
department have a sense of how much the average fare will increase with the combination of increased aeronautical fees and the uh, airport improvement fee? What percentage of, uh, of, a, of a fare is likely, likely to be the increase? Thank you. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, $29 for southern flights and $19 for northern flights. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart? Nothing further. Nothing further. Next to have Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to go on the record for saying that uh, the travelers that I represent um, and consulted with don't mind paying the extra cost if they're going to get service. So it's cost of service. And a, a couple of things that was brought to my attention was the uh, delays and, and the long lineups going through security for one thing. The delays and the icing, which may be passed on to their uh, or disrupt their connection flights leaving the uh, YZF uh, airport. So just for the record, I, I bring that out and uh, to ensure that our fees are going to go towards improvements in and around the building and the whole premises. Thank you. Thank you. Comment noted. To, to that, Minister Schumann. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as the Minister of Transportation, probably one of the biggest complaints I get about the airport is the lineup for, for security screening. And that's the nice thing about this, this new revolving fund is that some of the stuff we will be able to address immediately. Well, not immediately, but that's probably be one of the top priorities, I would think, of, uh, of moving forward on what we want to rectify. But that's the kind of comments we've been hearing from a number of people that, uh, that is, as long as the money is going to improve the, the service of the airport, structure to help meet the needs of the people of the Northwest Territory. So thank you for that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Mr. O'Reilly, did I have you next? Uh, no, but I'd be happy to ask some questions. Okay. <laughs> next I have Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks. And, uh, yeah, the, the, the minister just mentioned uh, CATSA, which is the Canadian Air Transport Security Authority, which is actually a, a federal agency. <coughs> so how uh, can we have a say over what the federal government actually does in terms of uh, uh, security lineups, uh, you know, most of everybody in this room has been out there. There seems to be two units, only one ever seems to be on online at any time. The, the problem doesn't seem to be the lineup, the problem seems to be with the staffing. Uh, and, and maybe the configuration could be improved in some way, but we can't tell those people who to hire and hire more people and so on. That's a federal responsibility. So how can the, con the minister convince me that setting up this revolving fund is going to result in uh, um, uh, shorter wait times in the lineup. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Conway. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Department of Transportation works closely with CATSA, as we do with NAV Canada and uh, other federal agencies that, uh, that uh, operate out of the airport. Uh, we've been working closely on this particular issue. Uh, CATSA has got um, a fair bit of uh, pressure across the country on, on these lines in Toronto and Ottawa and, and almost all of the major cities. CATSA has come out with a, a new program called CATSA Plus. Uh, we jumped on that as quickly as, as we could. What it does involve though for the Yellowknife Airport is to change some of the building components itself. So the amount of room that we've provided for CATSA would have to be enhanced. Uh, we've had meetings with CATSA. We're certainly on the list as a priority for that uh, organization. And we are, at this point, working with them to come up with a plan that will allow us to, to change the airport to take this, this new CATSA Plus system and improve our throughput and get, get better on-time delivery. Thank you. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no, I appreciate the response. Um, so the this uh, CATSA plus uh, reconfiguration, I take it that that's not included in the $30 million uh, sort of capital estimates that are found for the next five years of um, improvements in the business plan. This would be additional costs above and beyond the $30, $30 million. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Schumann. <coughs> yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
the CATSA side of it, that's that's their bag and, and their expense, but we have to reconfigure the airport to meet the needs to make it a uh, bigger, faster operation. So the area that, that it's encompassed in would have to be expanded. And part of this to get there is to have this revolving fund to have the capital to be able to do such projects. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to nail this down, then, so then the improvements so that the minister just talked about, is that included in the $30 million that's in the business plan for uh, the capital stuff? Or the next five years for the Yellowknife Airport. Thanks. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To be quite clear, the DOT portion of that is in there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? I had one other, one other if I may. Um, Certainly. I think one of the concerns I've heard, too, is about uh, sunsets on the airport improvement fees. So is this going to be something that's going to last forever, or... Um, can the, 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 is the idea to build up the fund to a certain point and then back off on, on the AI, the airport improvement fees on tickets, or is this something we're always going to pay? Uh, I, I think in Edmonton, I don't know if I actually pay an airport improvement fee, or maybe it's hidden in some way, but can, is the, the AIF, is this something that's going to be sunsetted? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Newdorf. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, we are planning to carry on with this funding model until uh, a better idea comes forward. But uh, it is a revolving fund, and so all the revenues generated will go into the fund. The expenditures will come out. It's not a profit-making uh, uh, venture. So as long as the revenues and expenditures balance out over time, then that's how we will continue. If we don't have enough uh, revenue to deal with all expenditures, then you know that's something the, the airport would have to look at at that time. And same, uh, likewise, if we have too much revenue coming in, then we would uh, have to take a look at that and to adjusting our revenues downward. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Okay, thanks. Um, and as I understand, the uh, airport improvement fee and the other fees uh, that are mentioned in the business plan, those are set in regulation. And uh, uh, how quickly can you respond, though, uh, um, if they have to be adjusted one way or another. You have to go through a gazetting process that requires public notice and so on. So what kind of flexibility do we have to adjust those fees to, uh, you know, on an annual basis, looking at the, the revolving fund and what's in there and what's planned? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Newdorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the process to change, update that regulation would not be that complex. It would be a month or two to get it done. But we would plan to look at that annually, again, as part of the business planning process. You've got to make sure your revenues and expenditures are balancing themselves out over time. And so we would look at it annually. We would plan, build in an annual review of the, of the fee regulations to make sure that they're appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly? Thank you. Further comments, questions, concerns from committee? Seeing none. Okay, I think that, that uh, we've concluded this stage of, of our review and uh, we're going to have, we have a number of folks now from the, the general public that are going to speak. And so, um, um, are we going to... Just one moment. Okay, uh, we reached a point in time where we're going to now take uh, public submissions and I have a list here so I'll go through the list as presented to me 
And uh, But I do want to remind folks uh, before we get started that the public submissions this evening are for us to be able to get uh, your comments and your uh, opinions on the record. Um, but there won't be uh, questions uh, directed to the minister or staff at, at this time. It will simply be an opportunity to have your your uh, views and opinions put on to the record. And so the first uh, group that I have that come to the witness table, please, would be NWT Tourism. I have Kathy Bolstead, Don Morin, and Mike Olson. Acknowledge the former Premier of the Northwest Territories here speaking before us tonight. Thank you. Um, so before we get started, can I ask, uh, will three of you be speaking independently or is one person going to be leading? Um, Don, can you answer that please? Thank you. Yeah, all three of us will make this presentation. Okay, I just for the, for the purposes of um, uh, exchanging the conversation, just please let me know when the, the whomever is going to take the next part of the presentation so that we can um, properly uh, do the exchange through the uh, technician on, on the microphones. You don't have to worry about touching your buttons here at all. As soon as you let me know uh, that Mike or Kathy will be taking the next part, then I'll, the conversation can be exchanged through me. So you're free to begin whenever you like, Don. Thank you. Thank you, Corey, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening, members of the Staten Committee. Uh, my name is Don Morin. I'm the chair of NWT Tourism. I'm also a local tourism operator. To my left is uh, Mike Olson. He is a member of the board of the NWT Tourism, and he's co-owner of Top of the World Travel, another tourism business based here out of Yellowknife. And to my right is our executive director, Kathy Polstead. Um, the whole reason we're here this evening is to uh, make a presentation on this uh, Bill 7, uh, 7, an act to amend the Revolving Fund Act. And the uh, reason we're here is that on November the 1st, we had our annual General Assembly and a resolution was passed by the members opposing uh, an increase in fees to the Yellowknife Airport whether it be landing fees or improvement fees or whatever it is, um, our membership was opposed to that. We don't have uh, hard data uh, to tell you that it will have a negative effect on tourism, but we do know our business and we believe that it will. One of the biggest uh, detriments to uh, uh, bringing tourism into the Northwest Territories in the past, especially into Yellowknife and uh, the Aurora market was a lack of hotel rooms. Now we seem to have solved that. And one of the other biggest detriments was the cost of uh, travel into the Northwest Territories. Uh, we, uh, as uh, tourism companies, um, compete in a world market, not a local market or a northern market or a Canadian market. It's a world market. So that tourism, whether it's uh, in China, or in Japan or Korea, when they get on a plane, they can go anywhere in the world to see anything. Uh, they can see Aurora in many, many different places now. That's just an example. Iceland is coming on uh, fairly heavy with its marketing. Uh, direct flights from Edmonton, uh, they can come through Canada. Um, of course, uh, Alaska was always a competitor of ours, uh, and the Scandinavian countries. And uh, tour companies, for those of you that don't understand the industry, uh, there's many major tour companies in the industry that sell the product. And Yellowknife is right next to Scandinavian countries or Iceland. We're all on the same page, and the price is there. And the bottom line is the price, and it will affect. You get a large amount of our tourists coming in that are... Um, have uh, lower end budgets, they, uh, they look at the price and if they can see uh, Aurora in Iceland, that's where they're going to go, if they can go there for $30 cheaper. I know some people think that $30 is not a lot of money, but times that, 
by 15,000 or 16,000. And that's what we expect to do this year, just the one company. That's a half a million dollars. Those tour companies aren't going to swallow that money. Guess who has to swallow it? The tour operators in Yellowknife will swallow it. Your hotels will swallow it. Somebody's going to swallow that money because those tour companies are in business to make money. And when you increase the cost, you're going to lose some of those tour companies. How many? I don't know. But I've never heard anybody tell us that they've done the proper research to say that we won't. And that's government's job, to do their proper research when they bring things forward to make sure it has no negative effect on the economy. But I've never seen those numbers, or I've never seen any information on that as of today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy next to speak. Thank you, Mr. Morin. Next I have Ms. Bolstad. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, good evening, committee members. And... Uh, want to thank you for the opportunity for Northwest Territories Tourism to speak. I, I do want to also thank the Department of Transportation, the Minister, and, and the Deputy Minister, Regional Superintendent, and their Director. Um, I, I want to say that they've been excellent at having discussion with Northwest Territories Tourism, sharing their plan with us, taking our input, and they have certainly reflected in the engagement section of their five-year business strategy um, that they have heard us and what's important for the visitor experience to be a positive one, so we thank you for that. Um, just for clarity for the committee members, because I'm not always sure everybody knows who Northwest Territories Tourism is, you're, you're seeing two of our members here and our chairman, but we represent about 200 businesses uh, in the Northwest Territories that are either directly involved in the tourism industry or indirectly involved in the tourism industry. Our members are licensed tour operators, they're hotel operators, they're airlines, restaurants, fishing lodges, bed and breakfast owners. They're small and medium-sized business enterprises who provide services and experiences and products to visitors that come to these territories, most of those coming through our capital city, Yellowknife. Northwest Territories Tourism is also, and I think it's important to, to mention this, a member of the provincial and Territorial Tourism Industry Association, and we call it the PTTIA. And at the PTTIA, we look at and we address issues that are affecting our tourism industry's competitiveness and its growth potential in Canada. And why that's significant is because how Canada performs actually affects how the Northwest Territories performs. And it's in that context that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what's happening in Canada with respect to airports and why this is important to our industry. And then I think the last role that you're familiar with us is we're the destination marketing organization who invests $2.8 million on behalf of GNWT to promote the jurisdiction, to bring the visitors that, that we're hearing DOT talk about. Um, we want to clarify, because I'm hearing that DOT thinks we don't support the vision of a better airport, and we absolutely do support the vision of the better experiences, the less lineups, uh, business opportunities for people to put their computer down and have a place to work. Um, we would love to see a direct connection from Vancouver and other places here. All of those are good things. And we're not opposing any of those things as a tourism industry. We want a better tourism experience. What we're concerned about and our members have concerned about is the raised fees and the impact that's going to have on tourism. And so one of the things we are cognizant of is that airports are a federal responsibility. We see in the five-year plan that it's falling short of what the government of the Northwest Territories is, is expecting. But we see a transportation review issued in December 2015 that is very clear that the federal government should be stepping up and addressing the long times it takes to build infrastructure, stepping up and addressing the gap in the capital costs because airports in the north are lifelines for communities and they need to have that broader base support. Um, so that, that is a concern that we have, is that w are we letting, by moving to this model, the federal government off the hook? for what it, it needs to do for tourism. We're concerned about moving to a user pay system. 
In the absence of adequate infrastructure funding, it appears GNWT is going to go down a user pay. There doesn't seem to be clarity on who's going to control an answer to that. Removing it from outside of the GNWT removes the ability of committees like yours to have input into how that spending goes. Those decisions go somewhere else um, because it's shifted away from the broader tax base, um, have it having a say in where those dollars are spent. When we look at the number of travelers coming in and out of the airport and the number of the total visitors to these territories that are tourists, without knowing how many of those passengers or tourists are coming in out of the LNF hospital, it looks like most of the costs will be borne by Northwest Territories residents because there's a lot more traffic going through there than there are our visitors. But for those who work in the tourism industry, we know any increase in cost is going to have a negative impact on tourism travelers choosing a destination in comparison to other destinations. And one of our members, Joe Sparling, I think has shared with you as a committee his view of what the price elasticity is on prices and what that can and can't do if prices go up or down. Um, the visitor we're trying to entice, and I think uh, our chairman referred to that, looks at what does our destination have to offer in terms of products and experiences and what's the price they're going to pay to get here for that experience and the high cost to travel in Canada itself makes Canada uncompetitive and I want to I want to it, it's a factor that we're marketing and Destination Canada is marketing to attract visitors but Canada's airports cost a lot of money and Canada itself if you look at Kiwi.com aviation price index of 75 countries based on the cost to travel just 100 kilometers Canada placed last as the most expensive country for international flights when domestic flights get factored into that Canada places 70th out of 75. And that's just the challenge to get those people to Canada. We've got to get them one step further at a high cost destination into the north. So increases in airport landing fees or airport improvement fees are going to exacerbate our challenge to attract more international visitors. Um, so we are concerned increased cost is what we see in this model and we don't think and with due respect to the minister, we hear it's going to grow tourism. We don't see any studies being done to say what is the impact, a 30 or more, because there are other fees over and above that that are in, in the five-year plan, is going to have on our businesses being able to position themselves in a globally competitive market. And while we're focused on $30, I think we better not forget this industry, just direct spend alone is generating $167 million for this economy. That's what's at stake in the tourism industry, not $30 on an airfare. Because we, and the numbers we get from, from the GNWT, only talk about the direct spend, the $167 million. What's the GDP of that? What is, what is the larger spend of all the spin-offs associated with that tourism? And have we done our homework to know the price elasticity, and if prices go up, what's going to happen to, to affect that? So that's a concern we have about that. Mike, do you, do you want to jump in on airport efficiency? One moment. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Bolstad, Mr. Olson. Okay, so when we went with uh, DOT and in our conversations with our members who have also had meetings with DOT, it was our understanding that the revolving fund was going to be established for the purpose of ensuing money Insuring money was available to support capital projects to improve the airport infrastructure. But we observed that uh, the airport revolving fund is actually being established for the purpose of capital operating and maintenance. This opens the door for the airport to simply raise all kinds of fees to ensure capital investments and operating costs are recovered to, the to balance the bottom line. And it's not clear that in, fi in the five-year business plan what specific things will be done to make the airport operate more efficiently. So we need more guidelines as to what that is going to be. Uh, DOT has advised us that it is not operating efficiently because the government structure now, now with revenues going into the main government revenue base. And this is important to look at because it's if increased volumes of traffic of visitors based on lower prices can actually address the need for increased revenues, this would be a far better way to generate lower costs for northern residents, increase benefits by the growing tourism visitations. Thank you. Mr. Morin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Kathy and Mike. And just in closing, um, once again, um, you know, the membership of NWT Tourism is opposed to an increase of uh, uh, transportation in Northwest Territory through this Yellowknife Airport Revolving Fund tax. And, uh, you know, we believe that it's going to have a negative effect on tourism. We compete in a world market, a world market. And uh, I don't know who in this government uh, has uh, done the research to check how it will have a negative effect on that market. Um, quite a few of our bigger tourism operators will be able to handle a downturn in tourism, no problem. The smaller ones are going to be the ones that are going to have a hard time. And um, so um, with that, uh, if there's any questions the members have, I'll be pleased to try to answer them. Thank you. Um, really, this is probably not a time in which we would direct questions uh, to um, the presenters, but if there's anything that the presenters spoke on that committee feels they need some clarification on, I'll uh, allow that opportunity. Any clarification required for committee members? Seeing none, I want to thank the uh, NWT Tourism, Mr. Moore and Mr. Olson, Ms. Bolstad for coming and presenting tonight. We appreciate your comments and concerns. Thank you. All right, we'll let them move out of the way there and get reseated. The next uh, group that I have coming to present tonight is the Chamber of Commerce, and I believe their president, Renee Como, is here this evening. I'll ask Renee to come on up to the witness table, please. Thank you, Renee, and we'll uh, turn the microphone directly over to you, and you can uh, share your comments with us. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the Standing Committee. My name is Renee Como. I'm the President of the Yellowknife Chamber of Commerce. The Yellowknife Chamber of Commerce represents 350 Yellowknife businesses. Our mission is to be a leader in the improvement and development of a strong Yellowknife business community. Following, following several information sessions, Membership engagement and through analysis of the draft Yellowknife Airport five-year business plan, the Board of Directors for the Yellowknife Chamber of Commerce have voted unanimously to support the proposed changes to the Yellowknife Airport's financial model. To make the Yellowknife Airport financially self-sustaining, the proposed model includes an increase in landing fees, general terminal fees, common use fees, and an, sorry, and an airport improvement fee. We support this move to financial self-sufficiency because it will allow the LNA Fairport to follow through on long-term plans for growth. We also believe that under the proposed model, Yellowknife will remain a competitive air transportation hub for passengers and cargo. Our support for the proposed fee increases is conditional on the approval of Bill 7, an act to amend the Revolving Funds Act. This is because we want to ensure that all funds generated at the Yellowknife Airport will be reinvested back into the Yellowknife Airport. Section 2 of the Revolving Fund Act states, the assets in a revolving fund must be used only for the purpose for which the revolving fund is established. And Bill 7 states that the, propose, the purpose of the Yellowknife Airport Revolving Fund is meeting the capital, operating, and maintenance requirements of the Yellowknife Airport. Bill 7 will result in the establishment of a revolving fund where all revenues generated by the Yellowknife Airport must be reinvested back into the Yellowknife Airport. The funds from the airport improvement fee will be segregated and applied to capital expenditures, where aeronautical fees, including landing fees and general terminal fees, will be applied to operations and maintenance. The Yellowknife Airport already collects these fees, but right now they go into the GNWT's general revenues. If a revolving fund is established, these revenues will be directed back to the Yellowknife Airport. The Yellowknife Airport is a critical piece of infrastructure, and the Yellowknife Chamber of Commerce has been actively advocating for the federal government to increase funding for transportation infrastructure in the north. But the north has a large infrastructure deficit, and our airport needs investment now. Our airport needs investment for better consumer safety, sorry, for better customer safety and convenience. We need investment to enhance the tourism experience for visitors and for route development, which will of tourists coming to Yellowknife and the Northwest Territories. We need investment in the Yellowknife Airport to open new markets for our Yellowknife businesses. We need investment so the Yellowknife Airport can generate non-aeronautical revenue through parking, new shops and restaurants. Non-aeronautical revenue can enhance the tourism experience, create jobs and will become important sources of revenue for the Yellowknife Airport. 
Bill 7 will allow the LNIF Airport to become financially self-sufficient and to operate more like a business. A new financial model means a new operational model that could decrease the cost of air transportation in the future. This echoes the findings of the Canadian Airports Council and the Conference Board of Canada, both of which released 2015 reports that argued airports should pursue more commercial revenue opportunities. To quote the Conference Board of Canada, if airports can generate more revenue from non-aeronautical services, this allows for the possibility of lower aeronautical revenues and ultimately lower air fares for passengers. Airports around the world have evolved from being public sector infrastructure providers into sophisticated business-oriented service providers. It's time for the LNIF Airport to do the same. The LNIF Chamber of Commerce views increased investment in the LNIF Airport as essential to creating opportunities for businesses in LNIF and across the territories. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Como. And any points or any requirement for clar clarification on anything Ms. Como shared from us or shared with us from committee. Seeing none, thank you for sharing your uh, presentation with us this evening, and um, your comments and concerns are now on the record for this public hearing. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, next I have on my list. Mr. Brad Inge, please come on up to the witness table. Thank you, Mr. Inge. I'll turn the microphone over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and the committee, and Minister, Assistant Deputy Minister. Nice to see you all here this evening. I'm here as a private individual, uh, Dene Indigenous person of this great homeland we call the Northwest Territories. Um, I'm grateful for the committee embracing the, the concept of public participation and practicing government transparency and accountability. And for allowing me to share a few thoughts with you tonight. Um, in advance of uh, today's committee meeting, I submitted a copy of the guest editorial comment that was published in the Alnifer newspaper on Wednesday. November 28th, and I would like you to take those comments into consideration in your deliberations and decisions. Um, I've lived in, uh, as a result of various occupations I've had in my lifetime, I've had the opportunity to live in Alberta, and while I was living in Edmonton, the Edmonton Airport Authority went through the same process that we're just going through now, probably uh, a couple of decades ago, uh, and the same arguments that were presented back then, I'm hearing again, it's almost like Groundhog Day, where tourism was going to be affected and everybody was opposed to any kind of a fee and there was threats or uh, expressions of uh, dissent where people were going to go to airports where there wasn't an airport improvement fee. And we can see what the Edmonton International Airport has done with their airport improvement fee and how uh, massively larger that establishment has become and quite a good model, uh, lots of improvements there. And I foresee something like that happening here uh, if the uh, airport improvement fee does proceed. Um, personally, I've never known anybody to refuse to travel to a destination because they had to pay $20 more. Um, I don't think anybody in the Northwest Territories is gonna refuse to leave the Northwest Territories and head south because they have to pay $20 more. I think it's an unrealistic proposition where people are gonna to refuse to travel because they have to pay $20 more. It just doesn't make sense. Um, I would also like to share with you kind of a, a unique perspective that I have uh, because I, I do work at the airport. I do work there on the weekends. I'm the air, uh, manager for cargo for WestJet and Air North. And I work seven days a week. On the weekends, I'm at work at the airport from 10 in the morning until 5 in the afternoon, sometimes 6 or 6.30. Handling cargo, dealing with luggage, and providing ground services to the aircraft on the ground. Um, so I'm quite literally the boots on the ground that you see at the airport once in a, once in a while. Uh, as you travel 
to and from Yellowknife. Um, so some of my experiences and comments are based on anecdotal experiences from the year and a half that I've been there. I work outdoors on the ramp and the apron, the gates uh, that require deplaning and end planing passengers who have to walk outdoors. Uh, just this past weekend, um, we had freezing rain at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. That whole weekend, that ramp and apron where the airplanes park and <coughs> deplane and end plane passengers, it was a life and death situation. That was a little bit hyperbolic, but it was very, very slippery, and we had to really warn the passengers to be very, very careful out on the ramp because they could injure themselves. I've seen my colleagues at work, I work for Strategic Aviation Services, they've slipped and fallen. Um, just jumping out of an aircraft after unloading or uh, after unlo uh, loading or unloading the uh, uh, cargo luggage um, pits, we call them on the plane, um, and they've fallen on the ground. Uh, pushing or moving equipment, going in and out of equipment, it's hazardous for the employees. Uh, not to mention disabled people, the elderly that have to walk on that ramp. Uh, so improvements need to be made. One of the ones that I foresee, hopefully, is a second story being built on that building where we can have a mechanical jetway where people arriving on jets don't ever have to set foot on the ramp. They can, we have an accordion style jetway attach itself to an airplane. People walk in there through a tunnel and into the building. Uh, you see that around the world. And quite frankly, it's, it's disappointing to see um, that our territorial capital airport does not have what would normally be classified as a standard piece of equipment to service the public and aircraft. Um, for the smaller aircraft, because we do, the company I work for, we, we provide ground service equipment and employees for Northwestern Air Lease, a small little airplane from Fort Smith, uh, Air Canada Jazz, their Q400-8s, and Air North and WestJet. Luggage and cargo and passengers. There's an awful lot of congestion in the airport itself. The airport, in my respectful opinion, and with all due respect to the Department of Transportation, I think is lacking and wanting improvement uh, it's almost on the verge of becoming obsolete. Uh, we should have ITAB check-ins. I mean, this is the age of technology, and we don't even have ITAB check-in uh, kiosks where passengers can tap a screen and print off their boarding pass. Um, the equipment inside the airport itself, the belt that you see behind the customer service agents that check in and bag, uh, tag your bag, that piece of equipment is quite old and it's breaking down quite frequently. It needs improvements, it needs upgrades. Um, areas of the airport that you don't normally see, I get to see. I have a red pass, I get to go behind the, the big green wall uh, where we process luggage and cargo. That area there is very heavily congested when you have four planes on the ground. Every Sunday, Northwestern Air Lease, two uh, Canadian North jets and a first air, uh, summit air aircraft, jet aircraft are all converging in that, in that one bag room where all of us ground service employees are trying to sort luggage, sharing the same carousel, and trying to get the planes out on time uh, with, uh, without lost baggage. You know, we'll, we all know what it's like to arrive at your destination not have your bag there with you, uh, waiting for you on the carousel. It's very frustrating. Other things that I've observed in the last year and a half, is I get to operate equipment on the ramp, or the apron as, you, as some people call it, is that I get to drive a tug hauling luggage carts behind me filled with bags. Um, pulling up to the building to unload luggage for the arriving passengers, we're standing outside, hand bombing luggage outdoors into two little portals. And um, it's hazardous for a couple of reasons. A tug we, we cannot attach four luggage carts to one tug because the total length of that equipment will block both doors, the arrivals door and the 
uh, exit door for passengers that are about to board their aircraft and after they've gone through security. They, it would block both doors. So we ha we're, we're restricted to keeping it down to three luggage carts so that we don't interfere with people trying to get into the airport and people trying to leave. Uh, other things that I've noticed at the airport is the de-icing pad. And this is the time of year when de-icing is, is a daily routine. The, the, the de-icing pad, where it's located, paralyzes all the aircraft at gates four, uh, five, and six. Because the de-icing pad is right <laughs> at the tail end of those planes as, as they're facing the terminal building. So no, there's no aircraft movements until that plane is de-iced and has moved off to the taxiway to, to the runway to take off. Um, so we need some improvements at this airport. We need a better location for a de-icing pad so that there isn't the, this paralysis. Um, other things that I've noticed uh, are things like security. Security, I, I don't know what the fire code restrictions are with respect to the area after you've cleared security and whether or not uh, we're violating the fire code by having too many people in that floor space. Uh, but, but it seems to me that when you have two or three full aircraft and you know, WestJet's bringing up 737, 800 series, which can seat 174 people. And if that plane's full and you've got four aircraft, four different airlines with passengers in that waiting area, um, see the, the, the fire code capacity for people to be in one, one, one particular area in that airport. So that alone, I think, would merit some support in doing some renovations, making some improvements. And there's absolutely no hot food services in that waiting area. So when, once you clear security, you got two vending machines. Um, you go to Edmonton. What happens after you clear security? You've got like a giant-sized West Edmonton Mall facility with all kinds of conveniences, hot food and cookies and, and, and um, franchise restaurants and whatnot. And um, the, uh, I'm, I'm glad the issue about CATSA came up with the security clearance. Uh, it's a very inefficient uh, space in order to process passengers quickly and efficiently. Because uh, uh, in my observations, I see a lot of uh, passengers at the end of the line. Their plane is loaded, and they're at the end of the line. They still haven't cleared security yet. So you, got, you, you have security delays that put everybody's schedule behind trying to make connections. So it would be nice to have a re reconfiguration and enlargement of, uh, of the security clearance area. And we do, as part of my primary job out there is to handle cargo for WestJet and Air North. And the, the process of, of cargo is very inefficient. And uh, it's, it's actually quite funny where uh, I bring cargo through the restricted area bag room, roll it onto a conveyor system, in through the oversized x-ray machine, and the rails don't even line up. So I'm pushing the cargo through, and then I got to run through the door to make sure it doesn't fall on the floor once I get on the on the <coughs> on the um, oversized X-ray side. And then when you push the or process cats are processes the cargo and the oversized bags, it comes out of the X-ray machine, and the tables don't even line up. And you got to be on the other side on the receiving end to make sure that the customer's property doesn't end up on the floor and uh, and damaged. Um, we need exterior structures, like uh, the smaller aircraft in, in Edmonton and Calgary, they have built, built structures, standing structures out on the apron. So when you pull up in a small plane, you've got maybe a 100 foot walk before you end up inside of a corridor that has a roof and heat, and that corridor takes you inside the terminal. It would be nice to have something like that here, so that it removes the risk that people are put at, disabled, and I see a lot of people on, on um, medical travel. Um, they're, they're in a vulnerable state already, and yet they're being required to walk on, a, on, a, on an icy wet during the summer, wet ramp because water pools um, in that gateway where the, where the airplanes park. 
So it would be nice to have a revolving fund of money that can go right into making these kinds of improvements and make life better. This is a capital of a territory and we should have an iconic airport just like we do have a brand new hospital. If there's two pieces of public infrastructure that are critical to a community, it's an airport terminal and a hospital. So, so they, one, uh, you know, you can um, obtain money to make itself financially self-sufficient. Of course, the hospital, you're not going to, it's not a for-profit situation uh, when, when people are ill and, and uh, in need of medical assistance. Oh, Another thing I wanted to do very quickly in wrapping up is um, uh, we don't have any washroom access inside the secure area for ground service employees who, uh, who are working and processing bags. We have to come out into the public area. Um, and uh, from an aircraft maneuver, maneuverable uh, capacity, when gate one, gate one is, is set up or established for military aircraft and special charters and whatnot, when those big U.S. Air Force um, heavy lift uh, aircraft arrive, they block that. The gate one blocks off any other aircraft from being able to access, uh, I think it's 16, right, Mr. Noor? <laughs> uh, anyway, there, there's 3416, the, the main runway. It's uh, 16 right where it gets blocked off. You can't maneuver an aircraft past there to get to the end of the runway to take off. You've got to go uh, quite some distance uh, and circle around and, and, and run down the runway and then turn around and, uh, and take off from there. Uh, the snowbirds, for example, this past summer, I noticed, you know, when, when they were all had their jets parked, uh, uh, 16 right was completely off limits. You couldn't get any aircraft past there because all the, all the snowbird jets were, were parked there. I could, um, I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. I, I, I've taken up too much time already. Um, but I would just like to close by, uh, by saying, um, uh, if you build it, they will come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Inge. I don't think you get to uh, uh, state claim to that quote. But uh, <laughs> uh, just before you leave the witness table, uh, only do we need a point of <laughs> clarification from committee? Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to Mr. Inge. Tonight, it's nice to have a first-hand experience of someone who actually works at the facility. Um, you mentioned uh, your experience with the Edmonton International Airport. At the time that was happening, were you employed or otherwise involved with the airport, or were just um, living in the city of Edmonton at the time? Thank you, Mr. Um, at that particular time, uh, I was married with three kids, traveled using the airport. I was a member of the RCMP then, and uh, so I just used the facility, but. When the airport fee was proposed, um, <laughs> I wasn't going to deny my family a, a trip by air because I had to pay $20 more. I think it was 15 when they first introduced it. Uh, it was a temporary measure. But, um, but like I said, uh, some, just from a third, you know, a hearsay, um, uh, some of my colleagues said, though, well, they're going to fly to Calgary instead because they don't have a $15 airport fee, airport improvement fee. And I said, yeah, but you're going to have to fly if you're going to, you're going to have to fly or get from Calgary to Edmonton. And that's going to cost you $300 ahead. So what are you better, much further ahead paying $15 ahead versus $300? So it just doesn't make sense. You know, it's, it's not a... You know, you, you can take $20. In fact, I have $20 right now, and I'd like to be the first person to make that contribution. <laughs> Thank you. Nothing further? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Ringy much. Thank you for your comments and, you. and sharing your comments and concerns for the record. Much appreciated. Okay. Without further ado, right into our next presenter. I'll ask uh, Rami Kasim to come up to the witness table. Thank you, Mr. Kazim. I'll we'll turn the microphone over to you. My name is uh, sorry. My name is Rami Kazim. I'm a co-owner of Java Roma Gome Coffee and Tea, and I have retail store at the airport. And um, after uh, hearing this discussion, I'm looking actually forward to see the improvement uh, at the airport and. Uh, 
I believe uh, every and each one of us in this room is supporting uh, improvements to the airport or any other facility. But the issue of, is about increase the fees that will uh, that might lead to the increase of the airfares, and some people believe that it will decrease the tourism or the tourists uh, coming up north. It might be a myth. Uh, why we think of the negative coming to the tourism industry, increasing the rate might not decrease the tourist numbers, but might be the opposite where you have direct flights uh, from all over and you will get cheaper ticket fares. Uh, I prefer increase in cost uh, with something that makes sense to me like improvements to the airport than paying $25 on the second bag and uh, now it's on the first bag <coughs> while you travel from and to Yellowknife. So changing extra, uh, change, uh, charging extra $25 per bag would also affect tourism, and this money will be spent down south, but not here in the Northwest Territories. I'd like to give a chance to this model, and if we, we will argue the increase in rate, I'd like to argue the increase on the fees of the uh, first and second bag to the airlines that that uh, actually hikes up the the fares to Yellowknife and make it harder for people to leave or come to the north. If that's the case, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kasim. Clarification from committee on the presentation. Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Kasim, thank for you. sharing your comments for the record and for being so efficient. <laughs> The room thanks you. <laughs> Next I have is Wendy Beesro. I'll ask Wendy to come up to the witness table, please. I always like to acknowledge our former uh, elected officials. And Ms. Beesro's former MLA for Frame Lake. And we'll turn the microphone over to you, Ms. Beesro. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening to uh, you, Mr. Chair and Committee, and to the uh, Minister and, and his staff who are here. Um, I'm not going to be quite as efficient as Mr. Kazem, I'm sorry. Uh, but I want to say at the outset that I'm, I am here on behalf of no organization, uh, simply as a resident of Yellowknife. What you hear are my own views and my own perspective. To me, this is a, a simple bill with a really complex context, and it's troubling for a number of reasons, none of which have to do with the language of the bill. Thank you. Um, I can't suggest anything in terms of the language in the bill. It's, it's straightforward, but it's what the bill will establish that I'm concerned about. I had a look at the Department of Transportation business plan for this year, 2016-2017, and under the airport division it says, and the minister has already described pretty much what's in the business plan, so I'm not going not gonna to go through that. Um, it, it's, it talks about uh, better positioning the airport and the economic um, impact that it's going to have and all that sort of stuff. And I have no argument with that, with that logic, with the proposal. Perhaps we should initiate a passenger, or initiate passenger user fees. It's no secret that the Yellowknife Airport needs improvements and upgrading, and many people have talked about that tonight. And a better airport will have a positive economic impact for airlines, airport businesses, this city and the territory. We know that. But we, and we also know, and it was mentioned by um, NWT Tourism, but we, I know we cannot expect improvements and upgrades to be fully funded by the federal government. They should be, and I agree with, with the, um, <coughs> the comment that was made by Tourism that it is a federal responsibility, but they're not going to take it. And we have experience, unfortunately, from that. The previous major upgrade out there was for security purposes. It came after 9-11. And it was to match regulations that were put in place by Transport Canada. It definitely was not fully funded by the feds. I was here at that time, and it cost the GNWT many millions in dollars. So no, it's not the concept that's troubling me. Research is done by the, the Lindbergh Group shows that the fees, both aeronautical and non-aeronautical, for our YK airport, YZF, and I'm going to refer to YZF from now on, are well below a sampling of other Canadian airports. Airports with both smaller and larger aircraft and passenger movements than YZF. It's what this amendment means from an operational perspective once it's enacted that is problematic. 
Firstly, why is YZF the only airport and only NWT airport which will become self-sustaining? And uh, one of your members of the committee read this earlier. Why is this one airport singled out? I understand it has the volume, the traffic, etc., to generate the needed revenue, but it will be the only airport in Yellowknife, in NWT, sorry, not subsidized by my, by our tax dollars. How fair is that? As I see it, I and residents of Yellowknife and of the NWT will be subsidizing all, under, all other GNWT airports through our tax dollars. No tax dollars will go to the YZF airport operations or improvements. And we will be paying a surcharge on our travel to help pay for our airport. So we'll be paying twice for the privilege, so to speak, of using the largest NWT airport. Once through our tax dollars, although none of those are going to be used at YZF, and again through a user fee. I appreciate that smaller NWT communities and their airports need the financial help to keep operating. But in my mind, what is good for the goose should also be good for the gander. And I was dismayed to hear the minister say that airport improvement fees are not at all com contemplated for other NWT airports. I heard him say a flat, no, it's not happening. So my question was, does the, does the department intend to implement at other airports? Well, apparently not. And I, previously to the definitive no, it didn't sound like it to me. And it's also been stated AIFs, airport improvement fees, are not unusual across Canada. Many communities have them. I found it interesting in looking at some of the documentation. Moosonee has a population of 3,500 and Sanders has a population of 5,400. Both of those communities are smaller than Yellowknife and they both have an airport improvement fee. One was quite low and one was somewhere around the $20 that's being suggested. <clears throat> so um, I, I find it unfair that this one airport is going to be uh, targeted with increases in fees and particularly an airport improvement fee. I feel that the government is double dipping and at the same time is absolving itself in this one community, in my community of Yellowknife, of the responsibility to fund community airports. I feel it is the GNWT's responsibility to fund community airports and to provide the infrastructure airport infrastructure in our communities. What other initiatives is the department going to put in place to raise revenues for other NWT airports? I suspect none. I didn't hear anything tonight that tells me there will be anything. This government, this territory needs new sources of revenue. And what other initiatives has the GNWT, the Finance Department, Cabinet, etc., taken to raise revenues? I don't think I've heard that that's happening. There have been other options um, put in, uh, suggested um, for years now, uh, but the government has chosen not to employ them. No, we're handed this business plan, which seemed to me to be a blatant action to raise revenues for GNWT coffers and to avoid a line on the books, which identifies expenditures for the operation of YZF. I suggest committee ask the department for an analysis of the revenue and expenditures for a few other NWT airports for comparison purposes, and Mr. O'Reilly was kind of going there earlier. Secondly, from everything I've read, and I have to say it hasn't been exhaustive, the department has given only a vague indication of how YZF will be governed. I heard a little bit more tonight about this executive council group, um, but I, I didn't realize that was happening. So I, I need to know how the collected funds are going to be managed. From what I can gather, it's going to be government, governance will remain within the GNWT in the Department of Transportation, but financed by a standalone fund. Will there be a governance council? I gather not. There's going to be some kind of an advisory council. Or will it just be a division within the department? What will be the membership? Will any governance group have public representation? This is my money, other people's money, and local and northern businesses' money. It should not be managed in secret and or by bureaucrats only. Much as I appreciate the work that bureaucrats do, and I know that they work in hard and uh, truly for, for, all, for all of us. In other jurisdictions with self-funded airports, an airport authority has been established to run the airport. It has not remained a part of the bureaucracy. So I ask, what oversight will there be for this suggested fund if it stays in the department? I don't think there's going to be very much. Like the Heritage Fund, the airport fund must be publicly governed. We don't yet have a public governance for the Heritage Fund, but we should. And it's unfortunate that the 17th Assembly could not get amendments to the Heritage Fund passed. Committee should not agree to this bill without an information or explanation on governance. 
and you should not agree to this bill unless there is public oversight. Do not let legislation for a self-funding airport get passed without public government and especially public oversight. Three, I found it interesting that the proposal is for the airport funds in the revolving fund to be targeting, targeted. I think they should be, but it was an interesting switch for me during my time here as a regular MLA, uh, as a member, sorry. When, during my time here as a member, regular MLAs fought very hard through committee work and through several motions passed in the House to try to target a portion of alcohol revenues for addictions programs, prevention and education. Can't be done, we were told. All revenue must go into the general revenue fund and then be distributed according to government priorities through the annual budget process. So why this change of policy? Is it because of a different cabinet, different minister? Or is it just a convenient way to get money to upgrade YZF? A convenient way to save millions of dollars that we are told must be saved to balance the GNWT budget. <coughs> you've heard tonight, number four, you've heard tonight from Northern Aviation businesses and tourism operators about the impact that the proposed fees and charges will have on their bottom line. I want to add my voice to their concerns, especially, um, sorry, I want to add my voice to their concerns as well. Margins for business are slim here, especially so for air carriers, both big and small. Increases in landing and other airport fees will only be passed on to travelers, and we heard that that expectation is, is, uh, is out there. We want to increase our tourism, at least we should, I hear that all the time, especially from government. Goodness knows we need to diversify our economy and increase our GDP. That said, from data provided by department and consultants, it looks like YZF's many airport fees are quite low compared to other airports of about the same size. Maybe a raise in those ra rates in those, maybe a raise in those rates is justified, but I leave it to committee to make that decision. But don't hit consumers twice, with both an airport improvement fee and increased ticket prices as a result of the fees increases to carriers. And if landing fees and so on are to be increased, be sure to look at the carrier's bottom line. Will they stay? Will they be able to stay and operate here under those conditions? WestJet and Air Canada are big enough. They can absorb a loss on northern routes and still operate. But our northern carriers? I'm not so sure. It's not the Yellowknife Edmonton route we need to be worried about, but the expensive to operate other NWT community routes that residents so depend on. If we put the northern carriers out of business, our small communities will lose that air force, air service. Unlikely that any southern carrier will step in to take over routes such as Yellowknife, Cambridge Bay. And if rates are to be raised, do them one at a time. Increase airport fees first and take some time to see the effect on airline ticket and charter prices. If it's not significant, then end an, an airport improvement fee. We know our costs will always go up, but please don't, to air don't do to air travel costs as has been done to our electricity rates. <coughs> Five, my experience with government has left me somewhat skeptical of government proposals. You may have got that sense already. I appreciate that this bill will ensure YZF revenues are only used for the operation of that particular airport, but legislation can be all too easily changed. Because of that, there is no guarantee that the YZF revenues will continue to be dedicated for use only for that airport. Will excess revenue be diverted to other airports at some future date? With the claim that YZF's in good shape now, now we need to upgrade other airports. Will excess revenue be diverted back to GNWT General Revenue Fund because of a negative balance sheet for the overall government? With this bill, either of those can happen at the will of the members of any assembly, this one or any future assembly. Number six, on a positive note, I'm glad to see that the business case put forward by the department, uh, their five-year business plan, still includes appeals to the Government of Canada for funding for capital improvements. It's mentioned several times in the document. And as I said, I believe it is the federal government's responsibility to help put infrastructure in place to meet the regulations that they demand. And I can only say to you and to the government and to the department, go after the feds and get financial help that we need. So in the end, I find myself wavering on my final opinion to tell you to support the bill or not. There's uh, pros and cons. And on the pro, I admire the initiative of the department in finding a new source of revenue. But the con, for me, I'm dismayed at the specificity of the proposal. Another con, why is only one airport targeted for, the concept, for this concept for new revenue? 
Pro research suggests that many airport fees are well below, well below Canadian averages. It's probably a good idea to increase them. Sorry to hear that, or sorry to say that to the tourism people. The con, why has DOT chosen to ignore the option of establishing an airport authority for Yellowknife? That omission makes me very nervous. I look forward to your report on this bill. You have a difficult job ahead of you, weighing the current GNWT fiscal situation with a need for new revenue sources, weighing the current GNWT fiscal situation with the costs we all bear as businesses and residents in this great territory, and weighing your responsibility to hold the government to account against public oversight for public funds. Good luck on that, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present my Thank you, Ms. Bezero. Committee, any need for clarification regarding Ms. Bezero's presentation? I think it was pretty clear. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Ms. Bezero. Committee really uh, appreciates your comments being shared for the public record. Thank you. Next I have, and just for uh, the, everybody's interest, I, we have two more presenters. Uh, and one other thing that uh, to those presenters who have presented tonight, if any of you care to actually share your, your comments with us, the written versions, so that we can have them on record, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. And they can be given to uh, Mr. Michael Ball here at, uh, at your leisure. Um, next I have Northern Air Transport uh, Association, Mr. Colin Dempsey. Is Colin here? Come on up, Colin, to the witness table. Welcome, Mr. Dempsey, and I'll turn the microphone over to you. Great, thank you. Um, it's very late, and so I will be brief. I just have a few comments, actually. We've submitted extensive written comments over the summer. I think I've spent my whole summer writing position papers on this issue, so I think we've fed you guys a lot of information. Just to kind of touch on some things that, that other people have said, and, and I will try and be brief. You know, it was mentioned that uh, industry has been consulted. I would say we've been presented to. The Northern Air Transport Association represents uh, 35 operators in eight provinces and three territories across Canada. We are the voice of northern and remote operations. We would expect to be included in, very early in the stages of development of this kind of proposal, and we were not. We were actually quite surprised uh, by this presentation. And, and none of our comments or suggestions have been incorporated into any development of plans or changes in plans. And I think we've put some forward some very reasonable and actually astute suggestions that would make this plan a lot more tolerable for industry and work a lot better and uh, create a much more positive economic impact. So we were disappointed not to see those uh, brought in. Uh, I keep hearing that this revolving fund is a first step. I would say first step is operating efficiently and accountably. Uh, I would say asking for more money from the taxpayers of NWT would be a step that comes after accountable and efficient operations. Um, there's discussion of investing in the airport. I just want to point out that th there's no indication and there's no guarantee that any of this money will go towards actual improvements. I've raised the question from the start. If you replace an existing piece of capital with a similar piece of capital or something that's marginally improved, is that an improvement or is that maintaining existing operations? I think that's a question that will be used to the advantage of whoever's spending the money. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, all these things, a bridge, extending the runway, more direct flights, it all sounds great. The numbers don't add up. None of this stuff is realistic. None of these things are actually going to happen based on what we've done, the analysis we've done. Um, just commenting on a uh, couple other things. Uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions, like I think we've seen tonight, you know, a lot of questions, well, we don't know, we're looking into it, you know, well, these are all things I want answered before we're going to ask people for more money, before we're going to implement a tax increase. Uh, I don't think that's unreasonable. Uh, we see right in Bill 7, uh, it cites operations and maintenance, not just capital improvements. So we see the legal framework is there right from the start to use this money for any purpose at all. It's, it's right there in, in plain text. As you say, it's not a complicated bill. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Testart, some of your points I just want to touch on. 
Uh, the aeronautical fees, yes, they are the, among the lowest in the country, but I would point that as a positive, and I would point to the uh, amazing success they've had in Whitehorse and the Yukon as a result of low aeronautical fees, and there's a position paper submitted by Joe Sparling that uh, highlights that and provides some very good data on, on that. Uh, speaking also to, you mentioned that the fees would be almost double. Actually, just to shock you, they're actually more than triple. Uh, so not almost double, more than triple is what we're looking at. So uh, very significant increases, and as has been pointed out, all at once, not phased in. That was one of the recommendations that me, we made, by the way, was even if we get to that level, could we phase it in in three steps, which, which we thought was, was quite reasonable. Um, I also, there's discussion of running the airport like a business. I'm concerned that there's a misunderstanding of the function of government and the purpose of government. Government is not a business. Government's purpose is to create and maintain a competitive economic environment to foster and support business. Uh, I, I think that there's a fundamental misunderstanding there. I think if we were talking about the hospital or health care, people would have a a better ability to understand the perils of user fees and running it like a business. It's the same thing with an airport. It's essential infrastructure. We're talking about groceries. We're talking about lumber. We're talking about heating fuel going to the communities. This is just as essential as health care. We need to keep costs low. We want to reduce cost of living in the Northwest Territories, not increase cost of living. It's already out of control. And, and speaking to that, and I'm sorry I get engaged and passionate about things and, and whatever else, but uh, uh, if I can uh, point point out too that it's been raised that, oh well, income in the Northwest Territories is so high, we can afford another $20, no big deal, 20 bucks, 20 bucks, whatever, let's just all pull out 20 bucks. Okay, let's look at uh, median income in the Northwest Territories, and then let's look at median income in the Northwest Territories adjusted for single parent families. And you'll see that income level is actually lower than the Yukon, lower than Ontario, lower than Quebec, lower than Alberta, lower than British Columbia. You tell me how a single parent family is supposed to survive, let alone take a family vacation, which should be a right of every Canadian, when they have a lower income living in the Northwest Territories than someone in Ontario or someone in British Columbia, where obviously cost of living is significantly lower, or Alberta, or the Yukon, uh, or Quebec. Uh, sorry, I, I said I was going to be brief. Um, just touching on, um, uh, you know, other points, travelers don't mind the increased cost. Well, as uh, Ms. Bolstad pointed out, we're not talking about an individual and in $20. We're talking about a, a t or maybe it was Mr. Morin, sorry. Uh, we're talking about a tour wholesaler that's purchasing bulk tickets, and we are talking about a significant increase and a significant amount of money. Um, the point was raised by Mr. O'Reilly about uh, uh, whether this fee would continue forever. I can't imagine the government ever giving up a revenue source. Sorry, I just being realistic. I'm sure once it's instituted, it will only ever increase. And touching on that point, Mr. Uh, Ng's point about um, uh, the fee in Edmonton started at $15. It's now $30. So just to give you an idea of what's going to happen here, uh, we start with a $15 fee, we get to a $30 fee, we start with a $20 fee, we'll get to a $40 fee very quickly. Uh, speaking to hard data, there's been a lot of discussion of how there's no hard data. That's obviously a problem. I've alluded to the Air North data that's been provided, which I think is excellent and I think demonstrates very clearly that uh, travelers are very price sensitive and that the economic impact of the increase will be greater, the negative impact of the increase will be greater than the revenue brought in by government. Uh, and, and I would stand behind those numbers. Um, cost of travel in Canada, as Ms. Bolstead pointed out, is completely out of control. We're among the most expensive countries to fly in the world. Uh, this will lead to increased airfares is a question I can tell you from our operators. Absolutely, this cost will be passed on directly to consumers. We're talking about southbound $28, $29, northbound $18, $90, as the Minister's staff uh, pointed out. Uh, they'll still be charging per bag, so don't think you're going to lose the $20 fee per bag because of the air. You're just going to pay both. You're just going to pay both, so you're, you're going to just be paying more. Uh, the other question is who supports this? I know First Air, I know Canadian North, I know Summit, I know Air Tindy, I know Air North, these organizations, I know WestJet, I, I, I know these organizations are all opposed to this change. I've heard YK Chamber supported, I've heard an employee, I've heard Javaroma, I haven't heard anyone in the aviation industry that supports this change. Um, uh, uh, just to, and just pointing to YK Chamber, I, I don't know why any Chamber of Commerce would ever support a tax increase. I'm 
sure about the basis of that discussion, but I think it may be misinformation or, or misunderstanding of information. Uh, you know, I have the question here, how much should we have to pay? I talked about that, $15 to $30. Uh, reaching the end of my. Uh, many communities have fees. Yes, absolutely. Most airports in Canada charge these fees. If you ask most people in these communities or even the people running the airports, they'll tell you that it's not good. It's a total waste of money. It's a cash grab. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it doesn't take much research to see that, that this has not been a good experiment. Um, and speaking to federal help, absolutely. This is the solution. Uh, right just recently, two weeks ago, the federal government announced uh, $50 million a year over 10, million, uh, over 10 years in infrastructure improvements. Uh, we need to wait and see how that plays out. Uh, that's a major new development and we don't need to be making major changes right now while that's still uh, in the air, not to mention other initiatives that the federal government's discussed that, that may be in the works. Anyway, sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dempsey. We appreciate that. Uh, any clarification required from committee? I think not, huh? So, again, thank you very much for presenting and putting your comments on the record for our committee. Thank you, folks. Thank you for your time. Okay. And we're down to this evening's last presenter. I'll call upon Mr. David Walselsu to the witness table at this time. Thank you. Mr. Walsh, I'll turn the microphone over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to keep my comments fairly brief. I, I didn't have uh, much to say on this, but there's a couple of things that are, that are concerning. Um, uh, much like previous presenters said, the bill itself is, is fairly matter of fact in only a few words. Um, but the overall concept that, that uh, public infrastructure is subsidized now. Um, this has been a piece of sort of common discourse in Yellowknife in the last few years. The city uh, used the same logic to add 200 parking meters downtown, so <coughs> that by paving roads, uh, parking spots was subsidizing, was subsidized parkers. Um, the airport is, is being subsidized and travelers are being subsidized. Um, by this logic, everybody uses a highway and everyone who uses any other piece of public infrastructure is equally, they're all subsidized pieces of, of infrastructure, which I understand and is uh, an interesting way of, of moving off on the costs. However, it ignores the fact that these are vital pieces of public infrastructure. Um, I was talking to someone earlier and their comment was, well, an airport's a luxury. Being able to travel by, by air is, is a luxury for a family. Um, people can drive, people can do other things. And, and sure, it, it is. But in the north, not all of our communities are connected by road. Um, much to the the government's chagrin over the last 40 or 50 years, we haven't been able to get all of the money to build roads to connect all of the communities. And, and the airports are the only way to travel to, to some of the communities. That's the only way some people can leave. They don't have the option of driving out. Um, and when you look at that, it, it's not about a luxury. It's not about families that just need to go on vacation or some goods that need to come in that way. But it's just vital public infrastructure that needs to be kept in place. Um, anyone would agree that you could just spend more money at the Yellowknife Airport. Uh, certainly heard a whole bunch of things today on capital improvements that could be used. Um, and uh, in reading some of these materials and some of the things that have come forward recently, um, that hasn't been successful at, at, through the capital planning process. The money goes to schools and hospitals and other vital pieces of northern infrastructure. Um, and I would argue that while this is a, 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 a very inventive way of sort of going around that process, um, the reason those other projects get uh, the investment dollars and the capital money is because they are more vital pieces of infrastructure. We have an infrastructure backlog in the north that is longer than my arm. Um, all of our arms together. Um, is the airport the one thing that we should be going around the, the capital planning process to spend that money on and do? Um, we found an inventive way of, of spending money on the hospital. We saved up money for a number of years to have the money that needed to be up front and invested it. And, you know, the city of Yellowknife and the whole territory is going to have a, a fantastic new hospital when it's done. Um, there's, there's a number of strategies in place, but this is just one that it keeps pushing. Uh, often this, the idea of airport authorities has, has been discussed today and it has come up many times before and if it doesn't happen today, I'm sure it will come up many times in the future, whether it's later in this assembly or the next assembly or the next. Um, there are obviously some ways of getting the airport off the books that, that are appealing because we don't have to manage pieces. However, when we talk, talk about the cost of living and the priorities of this assembly and reducing it, the average cost to a family, so a family of four traveling paying $20 each is $80. Well, it's pretty easy math. Um, there will be some extra increases based on landing fees and other things that are going up. So call it $100 even for a family. A 3% increase on a power bill, on an average family power bill of $200, you add that up for a year, it's $72. 
people are going to pay more increases to fly once a year than a 3% increase on a power bill. And every time the power rates go up, MLA stand up and shout about it, the paper shouts about it, everybody shouts about power rates going up, and we say, well, we can't do anything about it. It's just the cost of doing business. It's the cost of maintaining our infrastructure. It's what we have. This is a, something we have direct control over. This is something that everyone's going to, in the end, stand in the House and vote for or, or against, and it will be a direct impact on the cost of living for families in the North. And, and that's fine. Uh, if that's the choice and that's the direction it's moving. But I would like all MLAs to keep that in mind when they're doing this, that whenever we have discussions, whenever there's public conversations about that cost of living, that choices like this drive that cost of living up. Um, airports improvements are nice. Um, are they so nice that people are going to come here because we have a fancier terminal? Probably not. Are they going to come here because they can get off a plane without going down some stairs? Probably not. It's going to be nice, though, if you can stay inside, but it's kind of fun to have to run inside as fast as you can before you can get on a park you might have left inside or in your car. Um, and, and in closing, Mr. Chair, I, I just wanted to highlight that. I mean, it's, um, it's not a lot. It's 20 bucks, like everybody's been saying, but that adds up. It's 20 bucks for this. It's 20 bucks for power rates. It's 20 bucks for parking in the city. It's 20 bucks here. It's 20 bucks there. Salaries aren't going up in the north. Uh, High-paying jobs are leaving right now. Um, you know, mines are not opening, they're getting to their later years. A number of things are happening. And is this really the right time to be increasing the fees that families face uh, in traveling, that Northerners face in trying to access communities or anything else? I don't think it is, but that decision is, is uh, to the committee and to all members of the House. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wassil. Uh, any clarification required from the committee? From the presenter? Well, we thank you once again for sharing your comments for the public record. Much appreciated. Okay. Do we have any others that we didn't acknowledge that are prepared to speak this evening? Seeing none. If there are no further general comments and or presentations being made this evening, does committee agree to proceed to a clause by clause review of Bill 7 and act to amend the Revolving Funds Act? Committee? Agreed. Okay, committee agrees to conduct a clause by clause review of Bill 7. Sorry? Oh, yes, sorry. I'll ask the uh, minister and uh, staff to turn back to the witness table. Just for information of folks in the room, this is kind of more of the uh, formal phase and uh, um, it's not going to be very long, as if any of you have grabbed a copy of the uh, the amendment to the Bill 7, it's literally three sentences. And so, um, as most have spoke to or, or shared with everyone in the room, the uh, amendment to the bill itself is, is not really um, what's at stake or what people have been sharing. It's what the bill enables um, that has been... Uh, what folks have been sharing their concerns on and so but uh, procedurally we have to um, go through this next uh, phase and I just also want to let uh, folks know at this time too that uh, it is not the job of committee really to take any kind of position it is our job to do due diligence in gathering uh, public input and then we put that into a form of a report and that report gets presented to the assembly at large on the floor of the house and the committee of the whole and then uh, members uh, individually as MLAs get to uh, uh, share their opinion and debate the bill at that time. And that of, uh, we're hoping that that's going to come forward in the next session in February and March. So without further ado, uh, the committee uh, agrees to conduct a clause-by-clause -clause review of Bill 7. Let's turn to the one and only page of the bill. Clause 1. The Revolving Funds Act is amended by this Act. Committee, agreed? Agreed. Clause 2. The following is added after Section 2. Committee, agree? Agreed. Clause 3. This Act comes into force on a day to be fixed by order of the Commissioner. Committee agree? Agreed. 
Does the committee agree that Bill 7, an act to amend the Revolving Funds Act, is now ready for consideration in Committee of the Whole? Uh, Member Testart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that Bill 7, an act to amend the Revolving Fund Act, be reported to the Assembly for consideration in Committee of the Whole. Thank you. There's a motion in order. Motion is on the floor to the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Motion is carried. Bill 7, an act to amend the Revolving Funds Act, will be reported to the Assembly as ready for consideration in Committee of the Whole. I want to take this time to thank the Minister, thank all your officials, and thank you to everyone and all of our presenters for coming out this evening. We can now be adjourned. Thank you.